Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Wesley Whitaker and I'm one of your Ath Fellows this year. Before President Obama left office in January of this year, his last phone call as Commander-in-Chief was to a soft-spoken German woman with a doctorate in quantum chemistry, who also happens to be the Chancellor of Germany. Angela Merkel, who has just been re-elected for her fourth term, has proven to be one of the few leaders in Europe to remain after a wave of unrest has swept the continent. Part of her success might be due to the fact that ger the German economy is actually quite strong right now. And even in the face of growing far, far right-wing populism, the nation's politics are relatively placid compared to their neighbors. As one German put it, we're living on a ship of stability, and around us it is very stormy. The continued influx of refugees, the rise of right and left-wing populism, domestic unrest in Spain, the still uncertain future of Brexit, and persistent debt crises have made the politics of Europe very rough waters indeed. In times like these, European leaders may want to look to their allies outside of the continent for a sense of stability and an ally that they can count on to have their back. Nevertheless, the alliance formed under the highest possible stakes, NATO, which brought collective security to Europe and helped stare down the Soviet Union, has been called into question. On May 25th of this year, President Trump called out NATO allies and refused to commit to Article 5's collective defense clause, stating, 23 of the 28 member nations are still not paying what they should be paying and are supposed to be paying for their defense. Now, to be fair, when asked directly a few weeks later, Trump said, of course, we'll stand by our allies. Still, anyone listening to these remarks, or who saw the viral clip of Trump shoving the leader of Montenegro aside to be at the front of a photo op, knows that this administration's foreign policy can be summed up in two words. America first. Here tonight, tonight to discuss the future of European and U.S. relations uh, is Patrick Chamorel. Professor Chamorel is a, the re senior resident scholar at the Stanford Center in Washington, D.C., where he teaches political science with an emphasis on com comparative American and European politics, as well as transnational relations. In the 1990s, he was a senior advisor to the French Prime Minister, among other advisory roles in government. Since leaving France, he has written extensively on U.S. and European politics, with his research focusing on U.S. strategic, political, and economic relations with Europe and the EU, as well as the impact of globalization on governments, business, and civil society. In addition to Stanford, he has previously taught at UC Berkeley, George Washington University, and here at CMC, where he was the Crown Visiting Professor of Government from 2002 to 2005. <clears throat> Professor Chamorel's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Salvatore Center, as always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please silence and put away your cell phones at this time. And please join me in welcoming Professor Chamorel to the Athenaeum. Thank you, Wesley, for these kind words. And uh, <clears throat> thank you to uh, the Salvatore Center for sponsoring this, uh, this event and for inviting me. Thank you, Mark. Blitz, and I'm so glad that uh, Helen, uh, your wonderful wife, is here too. And thank you uh, to the Athenaeum and, and, and Priya and, uh, and Dave. So I recognize a number of uh, faces here. I'm so, so glad to see them. Um, I uh, don't know if the affluence tonight is an indication that European politics is no longer boring, or no longer complicated, or no longer depressing. Um, not boring, that I think I can prove it. Not depressing is much more of a challenge. <laughs> but I'll try my best. So what I want to talk about is this latest phase of European elections and American elections uh, that is redefining to some extent uh, what's going on within the EU and as well as transatlantic politics. Uh, so this started with Brexit, it's only 15 months ago, then continued with the election of Trump and that of Macron. And very recently, of course, we had the uh, election in Germany, and the last major election of this cycle should be in Italy in a few months' time. So it is ironic that uh, at the time of 
crises throughout Europe, and I will describe them uh, to you, and you probably know them already, uh, there is some sense of optimism you know, coming back uh, into European politics. And it is so ironic that part of the explanation is are two shocks, actually, two negative events for most Europeans that took place not that long ago, which is Brexit and the election of Donald Trump. But of course, they were succeeded by the election of Emmanuel Macron in France, not, not very old, in last May. And Macron ran on a very, very pro-European platform, uh, which is very unusual these days in European politics, where Europe is usually shown as the culprit, but not the uh, problem solver. So I will try to describe this new political context that is redefining uh, European and transatlantic politics um, to uh, try to point to the key ideas that are driving this uh, process and, uh, of course, mention the obstacles uh, that will uh, be met on the way or already are being met. So I'm going to start with the depressing part, which is, you know, the accumulation of crisis that has taken place mostly since the financial crisis of 2008 in Europe. Uh, but these crises of great gravity have fed on each other and created the impression that Europe was drifting away and maybe on the verge of implosion or disintegration. So those four crises, uh, we can break them down you know, other ways, but I will describe four of them. The first one is economic. It was the euro crisis that followed the financial crisis, but in 2010-11. And uh, that uh, was a crisis of sovereign debt. That means that you know, the least performing economies in Europe were exposed to very high interest rates and threatened to default. And of course, to the contagious effect was what uh, Europeans fear the most. So there is a word for to, you know, that people know about this crisis is Greece. No longer you know, ancient philosophy and democracy or nice vacation spot. No, Greece kind of captured all the problems, at least economic problems, of Europe. So of course, this uh, crisis has been somewhat contained, but nobody would say that it, uh, that it is contained for the long term. The second crisis is more geopolitical. It's mostly a crisis with Putin's Russia. And you, of course, uh, know about a few years ago the annexation of Crimea and the guerrilla war in the eastern Ukraine in the Donbass region. This is uh, something, of course, of great concern, mostly for East European. Uh, we have you know, some memories of, of their relationship, rela relations with, with Russia. But, and this crisis involving, of course, NATO and therefore the United States, as, as the latest uh, illustration, if you want, uh, the uh, interference of, of Russia in US, French, and German elections. Not that it would be a new phenomenon, of course, but it has become a point of contention. And then there is, of course, relations with Turkey, which uh, are uh, increasingly challenging for, for Europe, as uh, President Erdogan has uh, established uh, uh, a very authoritarian regime uh, around himself and um, has led a more militant 
form of uh, Islamism in his country and uh, anti-Western foreign policy. So, so this is also a major challenge at the, at the borders of Europe. Uh, and, and for NATO because, of course, Turkey is a key member of NATO. Um, and of course, it changes the prospect of Turkey joining the European Union. Uh, uh, there is no chance for Turkey to join uh, the EU in the foreseeable future. Um, I, I think I always think of, you know, the proponents of, of that membership, the United States or the UK. UK actually will as will leave the EU before Turkey joins. <laughs> um, and there is a diplomatic crisis going on between Germany and Turkey. So we went from, you know, the dreams of Turkey's membership into the EU to a, a diplomatic crisis with uh, the EU's main uh, country. The third crisis is about, uh, is, is the refugee crisis, which of course is a consequence of uh, the failed so-called Arab Springs. Uh, in uh, and the war in Syria. And it has received, of course, lots of media coverage of refugees on the roads of Europe or trying to cross the Mediterranean at, their, uh, at, 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 at the risk of their lives. Uh, so this crisis, for the moment, has been uh, constrained, I mean, contained, rather, on the Eastern Front, you know, just because the EU has decided to, to pay off Turkey to not let refugee cross, you know, beyond Turkey into, into Greece. So that cost the EU about 3.5 billion euros uh, a year and put them like in a situation of kind of being hostage to Erdogan, right? Uh, but the problem, of course, has, you know, has displaced itself, you know, toward you know, Libya and Morocco and the crossings toward Spain and Italy. So, so the issue is not over yet. And imagine in the future, for example, that a country like Algeria, you know, 40 million people, would be taken over by the most radical Islamists in the country. Imagine what kind of crisis it would be for Europe. So this is far from over. And the fourth crisis is precisely the crisis or linked to uh, radical Islamism and the terrorism that, uh, which of course you've, you've known the different stages with the, the attacks in, the, in, in Paris and Nice and, the, and Berlin, Manchester, London, and most recently in Barcelona. So this is a multifaceted issue which has to do of course with, you know, uh, ISIS and fighting ISIS in the Middle East, but also it's a cultural issue and a political issue and a security issue, of course, within Europe itself. And this is also for the, for the long haul. So, so again, these crises are not solved. They, are, uh, given the, they have given the impression that Europe was uh, not what was powerless trying to deal with them. Uh, it has been a problem for US-European relations around the, you know, the use of NATO, refugees, uh, terrorism. Of course, those are transatlantic issues. And uh, the fact that Europeans have more commercial ties, for example, with Russia, and uh, the US and, and, and Turkey is member of NATO, you know, has kind of created some gaps between the and, 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 and disagreements between the US and, and Europe on some topics. So it's also a problem for the cohesion of Europe, you know, because of these issues, this crisis, you know, uh, Europe ha has become more and more fragmented politically, with you know Northern Europe uh, and Southern Europe disagreeing mostly on economic issues. Know, the Euro, how to manage the Eurozone, tax issues, etc. 
and between East and Western Europe uh, on refugees or democracy and the rule of law. And, but finally, the, it is of course a crisis um, of multiple crises that have fed populism in Europe itself. And, and you've seen that um, you know, the most established political parties in Europe have election after election you know, faltered. Uh, that so social democracy, which is a staple political tradition in Europe, uh, is weakened considerably to the point that virtually no European country is governed by social, by social democrats anymore, even in Scandinavia. Uh, and, uh, and in place of these traditional parties, you have uh, the rise of, of populist parties, as Wesley said, you know, both of the right, mostly on the right, and some on the left, like Syriza or Podemos. Uh, and, uh, and these parties, of course, are all anti-immigration, anti-European, anti-globalization, uh, anti-establishment, and uh, their social base is about the same everywhere. You know, people who have been on the, on the uh, you know, wrong end of globalization, you know, the losers of globalization, uh, tend to join disproportionately these movements and the most globalist you know, elites uh, are on the contrary uh, for, uh, you know, against, against this trend to, towards populism. So, so this, so see, this is the situation, both economic, social, political, in Europe. But populism that has made inroads over the last few years has most recently uh, been so influential that it has altered you know, the, the whole politics of Europe and transatlantic relations. I mean by this that um, the uh, Brexit is a very good example of, of the progress of populism. So in the United States has been as the, the election of Trump been. And, um, and therefore, the partial uh, uh, disintegration of Europe and uh, you know, the worsening of transatlantic relations are due to, in great part, to, to uh, populists uh, making inroads in elections. And what's uh, really interesting is that the politics on both sides of the Atlantic have converged. And this is very unusual, actually, that U.S. and European politics in the same, sorry, in the same uh, electoral cycle, so in the same period, would be so close to each other. Um, but they, the themes are about the same, and, uh, and the momentum has been about uh, the same. So again, the ideology is very similar. The sociological base and the political cleavages are very similar uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. But then, you know, with Brexit and Trump, you had another effect, which was like, you know, that each election would create a momentum towards the next. So, for example, Trump used Brexit. Uh, he met with. Nigel Farage, uh, he, uh, he also um, tried to uh, convince his electors that because Brexit has succeeded, his elect he could be elected. So to, to, to make this idea that surprise can happen, you know, believable. Uh, so, uh, m so, Again, the same uh, kind of momentum after which, uh, after, after, after Trump's election, then he tried to very discreetly support Marine Le Pen in France. Um, but of course, we know that that didn't work. 
And, um, and it didn't work because um, for several reasons. Um, you know that all of these elections were actually uh, surprises. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's true for Brexit, Trump, Macron. Um, nobody saw these causes of candidate winning. Even the pollsters, especially the pollsters. And uh, it's because populism is fairly new, especially in the UK and especially in, in the US. And pollsters really don't know how to capture the behavior of people who are going to vote for these candidates or these parties. But in France, it was very different because pollsters, you know, know how to, how to seize, if you want, uh, the, the, the National Front Party. They, they understand the behavior of their electors. Um, so that's the first thing. Why, um, you know, most uh, who predicted the victory of, of Marine Le Pen over Macron were in the United States and, and in Britain? It's because uh, they thought that there was a momentum for populism and they uh, didn't realize that you know, polls in France are done differently uh, and, and are fairly reliable for this kind of, of, of elections. And then there is, of course, the notion that you know, in, in French elections, you have two rounds of elections, as you know, and, uh, and that changes almost everything because in the runoff, if you're qualified, and Macron and Le Pen were qualified, then you need allies. You need to get from like 20, 25% to 50%. And of course, Marine Le Pen had no allies among the losers of the first round. And so that made a very, very big difference. So the surprise actually in the French elections was not uh, that Marine Le Pen uh, lost. It was that Macron won or more exactly that the favorite was the center right candidate uh, who was defeated in the first round, uh, uh, Francois Fillon, uh, lost because of a scandal. That was the big surprise. Okay, so let me say a few words about Brexit and, and the Trump elections uh, and the uh, um, diplomatic uh, as, you know, fallout of, of these, uh, these elections or, or referendum. Um, all of Europe was against Brexit. And of course, Obama was against it. He even you know, made the trip to London to try to convince uh, the, the British people. Um, and that's understandable. Uh, first of all, you know, the, uh, uh, the US would lose a, uh, an ally who influences uh, the EU you know, in, in, you know, towards more free market, Atlanticism, et cetera. So of course the, U, the US would much rather have Britain inside the EU, influencing it, than outside. Because outside it means not only that it doesn't influence it, but you, you had a problem. You had one set of, of country to deal with. Um, the other reason, of course, is, is uh, the integrity of, of the EU. And uh, even those who uh, saw that uh, you know, Britain leaving would give some more leeway to, to, to the EU to integrate, uh, since the UK was a recalcitrant member of the EU, as we all know. Uh, even then, you know, the fact that for the first time ever, uh, a member state would leave you know, was going to be risk being a precedent. And so that was the thing to be avoided. And then when Brexit happened, all of the Europeans uh, united uh, on the same position in the Brexit negotiation. And why is that? Well, because uh, of course they can obtain much more in the negotiations if they are united, especially seeing that in Britain uh, the Conservative Party is not united. And that was even more clear after the election that uh, Theresa May uh, called uh, last uh, few months ago. So, so that's one reason. Another one, of course, is that um, 
that you know, the Europeans, they, they want to, to show that you don't have the same privileges whether you're in or out of the EU. And it's especially true at a time when these Europeans want to relaunch the EU. So not, not you know, make any of its fundamental uh, characteristic uh, weaken. So, so that's, uh, that's the situation which, uh, which is, of course, uh, unlike what was expected. You know, what was expected is that Britain would be first, but then there would be other countries. There was none. And on the contrary, the Europeans united uh, in the negotiations on Brexit. And they, you know, they are seven times bigger economy than Britain alone, so, so they obviously have the, the upper hand. Now Trump. So Trump also you know, predicted the dismantlement of Europe. Not just predicted it, but wished for it. Did it happen? Of course not. Um, so, and not only that, but uh, the, one, uh, the one election that stemmed this populist wave, you know, which is Macron's, you know, was, was the victory of a, of a staunch pro-European. Which who avoided, by the way, you know, probably a dismantling of Europe with Marine Le Pen. Uh, so, so what was, um, so what was, what were Trump's uh, statements or positions on this? Well, you, you mentioned some of them, uh, at least my table here, um, in our, in our uh, conversation. It was, uh, besides the EU, which is, very, again, a radical uh, position, because every American president has always said very early in the administration, even their campaign, that, that the, US, the United States you know, wants a, a united and strong Europe, that this is part of, you know, this is part of American security and interest. So, so so the difference is, is very, of course, very important. Um, but on, on NATO, Trump said that it was obsolete and uh, that uh, the Europeans should pay at least 2% of their GDP in the, on defense, should spend on defense. Um, obsolete, he didn't say why exactly, but I guess he thinks that mutual defense is passé. And, and NATO was founded in 1940. Nine, and that probably seems very old to him. And uh, second, um, on the 2%. 2% is, is only a goal. It's not even in the charter. And nobody ever linked the 2% with mutual defense, you know, which is Article 5, which is you know, one atta an attack on one is an attack on all. So that's the crux of, of NATO. Uh, but so, but, so if you want, Trump really, uh, you know, broke the rules uh, entirely, at least in his statements. But there was more than the EU and NATO. He, uh, he criticized Merkel for her uh, acceptance of one million refugees, saying that it was insane, uh, and as well as German exports, you know, uh, and, and uh, and a, a trade surplus that was too big. He says that France was no longer France, which meant that probably too many immigrants, especially Muslim immigrants. Um, so only Theresa May and Vladimir Putin had you know, uh, Trump's favors. So and then, of course, when, so that was at the time of his elections. But once he was elected, then again, uh, he went to a number of summits. You know, the uh, NATO summit in Brussels, the G7 in Sicily, and the G20 in uh, Hamburg. And that, he made a terrible impressions to the Europeans. Okay. Uh, 
because uh, he didn't even mention Article 5 when he was inaugurating the new NATO headquarters in Brussels. Uh, he criticized the German trade surpluses, saying that they were shipping too many cars to the US. Actually, half of them are made in the US that are sold in the US. Um, and of course, he said when returning from one of these trips that he would, he would not, uh, he would with withdraw from the Paris uh, Climate uh, Accord. So all of this was, of course, you know, shocking for, for Europeans, but uh, because it was so, uh, so new and, uh, and said with so much uh, uh, assertion. So of course, you know, one has to maybe try to s figure out why Trump did that. So maybe, you know, of course, you know, uh, breaking out the EU, not, uh, uh, you know, not backing uh, mutual defense within NATO. Maybe that was part of his worldview, you know, of America first and, and uh, done with multilateralism, um, isolationism, this kind of thing. So that could be this kind of, you know, part of a broader view of international relations. But it could only also be, you know, just electoral politics. This is the kind of talks that would appeal to the core of his electorate, but then that's a heavy price to pay, because to, to throw you know, NATO or the EU under the bus just to uh, you know, score a few, a few electoral points is something that you know, usually political leaders just don't do. Uh, it could be also tactical. You know, we think that, well, if I'm tough with the Germans on exports, you know, maybe they will abide, or if I'm saying that if you don't do the 2% two percent, maybe the Europeans will, will finally uh, do it. Actually, he might just want to claim credit for the Europeans to reach the 2% threshold. Because anyway, they were going to do it. Not because Trump threatens them, but just because the level of threats in Europe has gone up in the last few years. So they are but you know, your, their defense budgets has also uh, gone up. And of course, the last uh, theory would be, uh, you know, the, the Russia connection that Trump has, but that I won't say more. <laughs> In any way, the, the big question is, you know, are, uh, well, first of all, whether, of course, Trump will follow with some actions, he'll follow on his statements with some actions. We don't know yet so far, you know, he's, of course, uh, scared the hell out of the U East Europeans uh, who thought that uh, the U.S. would not back them up against Putin just across the border. Uh, but so far, there has been uh, no uh, negative action by, by Trump. The second question is, well, is Trump going to be uh, just a, a one-off? And then things you know, will, will, sorry, will return to normal in transatlantic relations. Um, or uh, is Trump actually uh, uh, you know, an illustration of deteriorating transatlantic relations? So be part of a longer trend uh, in, in those relations. So we don't know that yet, uh, but those are the questions. So you see what uh, the politics of Brexit have been and, and, and those of, of Trump. Now what has Europe's response been to all of that? Well, it seems that you know, Angela Merkel was very quick also making some statements uh, after one of these summits and she said uh, that uh, Europe could no longer rely on its allies outside of Europe, meaning. And that means the US. And that it was time for Europe to take, take its own destiny in its hands, which is exactly like what Konrad Adenauer, an older uh, German chancellor, uh, said uh, around the, the Suez crisis. Um, and in Merkel's CDU, uh, platform, the U.S. is not no longer referred as uh, 
uh, as a friend, but as a partner. So fundamentally, Europe has uh, tried to defend itself and uh, tried to reach a higher degree of unity you know, in front of these challenges. This is the European response, mostly. So on, on defense, um, so the Europeans have reactivated their fledging a defense policy and try, you know, started to increase their capabilities. Of course, that will take a long time, and that's not a sure bet even for the future, but, but for the first time, the Europeans have, have gotten a notion of the US maybe not always you know, ensuring their security in the long term. So we have to buy a, 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 an insurance policy against that risk. So that's on, on, on defense. On trade, also the Europeans had said in unison that they would retaliate against the United States if some American policies would hurt their economic interest, which has not been the case yet. Uh, but what is for sure happening is that since, you know, in the later part of Obama's presidency, the uh, TAFTA, you know, the trade, the, the, the the negotiations on a free trade agreement between the US and Europe kind of collapsed. And of course, Hillary Clinton didn't pick it up because she was, of course, uh, feeling the heat from uh, Bernie Sanders on, uh, on protectionism. Uh, since then, Europe has been concluding or is on the verge of concluding uh, free trade uh, agreements with Canada. It's, it has happened and it's even started to be implemented with Japan, with Mercosur in Latin America, and, and Australia and New Zealand, which probably is not you know, good for the United States. And of course, the withdrawal from the Paris uh, Climate Accord gave an opportunity for China, for example, to present itself as a great uh, defender of the environment, as well as free trade, which of course is all true. So, so the you know so these elections and statements you know and policies have fostered more unity on the part of the Europeans. But what the Europeans don't want is to further isolate the United States. They certainly don't want you know to be to pit Europe against the United States. Um, and and why is that? Well, it's just because you know there are these disagreements on the climate, on trade, on defense. Um, but there are also things that the US and Europe do in common. They have common interests. And uh, among them, uh, anti-terrorism, fighting ISIS. And, uh, and, uh, and, on, and this is a priority of Trump, and this is a priority of many, or most European leaders, uh, especially uh, like Macron. Macron, who uh, you know, France has been spearheading the, the fight against terrorism in, in West Africa, for example, and um, and this is uh, and but with the help of, of American logistics equipment, etc. And so Macron, you know, understands that he has to uh, keep Trump alert, alerted on, on this kind of conflict in the, in West Africa, and, uh, and and needs anyway America's help. Uh, and, the, and this joint interest have been the reason actually why even under Obama, but still under, uh, under Trump, you know, France has been uh, you know, America's uh, closest ally on, on, these, on these issues. And the, the fact that no European leader wanted to isolate Trump is the reason why Macron invited Trump to Paris for, the, for Bastille Day, you remember that? Uh, and it really uh, unfolded the, the red carpet uh, for that, for him. It's, it's because they both had, had an incentive for that, you know, Macron to bring the President of the United States to Paris and to 
talk one on one with him, just like uh, as he's done with with Putin, and for and for uh, for Trump also to to show that he has you know he's respected overseas, that he has potential allies overseas. But even though the two personalities could not be more different, and and, and so they are political philosophies, they managed to get along very well. Um, Maybe it was the handshake that you know you you all remember uh, happened in in Brussels in, at the NATO summit. You know Macron, uh, of course, had planned that handshake. Say, well, I have to show him that you know he's he's got to take me seriously. Um, but but both, if you think of it, both Macron and Trump are political outsiders who pulled a huge surprise in their elections. And, um, and they are also anti-establishment. And both are very pragmatic. They are no ideologues. So, um, and Trump you know, likes to, you know, to have one-on-one -on -one relationship, he prefers to deal with Europeans, not as a whole you know, at the EU level, but with you know, each country. And, um, and Macron, even though you know, it was expected that uh, Trump will really uh, privilege his relationship with, with the UK after Brexit, Macron has established himself as, a, as an interlocutor for, for Trump. Uh, it is also easier for, for Macron, who has you know, who's just won, won an election, than for May, who is embroiled with, uh, in Brexit negotiation or with Merkel, who had the ele her own elections, plus now the negotiation in the coalition. So, uh, so Macron, so the United States should not be isolated. Macron is making a, sp a special effort. But then Macron is not only the interlocutor to Trump, one of them, is also spearheading the reform of the EU. And that's because in his campaign, that was a big theme. So what, what are his, his ideas exactly? So it is that you know, as the sovereignties of member states have has, has decreased, you know, the, the sovereignty of the EU as such has not strengthened. And that Europeans, as they show you know, with the rise of populism, they need to have some more to have more protection from Europe uh, on trade, on, on terrorism, etc. So, so more protection means strengthening the Eurozone and uh, and of course working on uh, on issue as I said uh, like, like like trade. So Macron just uh, spelled out his whole program, you know, just uh, a few days ago uh, at the Sorbonne. And, uh, and so the question is, can he do it? Um, and so that takes, you know, it requires, first of all, Germany to be on board. And Germany has been uh, very uh, disappointed by, you know, France not being able to uh, rekindle this, its economy, and to relaunch itself politically over the last uh, you know, five or six years, especially under the very weak presidency of Francois Hollande. And, and for Germany, that was a real problem because Germany knows that it cannot, and it doesn't want to, but it cannot lead Europe alone. Look at on, on the Euro crisis. So Germany led, of course, Europe because it has the most influence, but nobody agreed with its very orthodox uh, policies, so it becomes the target of every other European country. So if you add France to the mix, of course you can talk to both, you know, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, Northern Europe, you know, so you have a much greater chance of moving the EU along. So, so the deal is this one. If France can reform its economy, then Germany is ready to go halfway meeting France's uh, proposals to strengthen the Euro Eurozone and to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to look again at, at, at trade in, in Europe. 
So of course, you know, there are many uh, Germans who don't, who are skeptical about France being able to do that, you know, in, including in, in Merkel's own, own party. And now in the FDP, which is one of the free market parties in the new coalition, which will be part of the new coalition. So you see that, uh, but it seems that Macron is actually starting to deliver. And so Merkel is, is on board, and I think that the whole coalition will be somewhat on board, not for all the details, but for what uh, Macron wants. And then, uh, so, f so they trust Macron to, you know, to fix the French economy. Now, do they trust Macron to, uh, Macron's ideas on, the, on stabilizing the Eurozone, for example? Again, very big differences in, our, in, in philosophies. You know, the Germans think that Europe would work very well if every country would fit within the 3% deficit rules, you know, and would, would have a very strict uh, monetary policy that the ECB, of course, has not exactly done. But the French think that they need to add to the monetary, to un, 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 unify monetary policy under the ECB, you need a more united fiscal policies, taxes, you know, spending, budget. And, uh, and that takes, you know, a finance minister for, the, for all of the Eurozone, as well as a, a, a specific budget or even parliament. So the, G the Germans, you know, will, will buy some of that. And, uh, and the EU authorities, especially uh, Jean-Claude Juncker in Brussels, you know, has some compromises in mind already. So, So what could be these, the content of these, of, these, of these European reform? I mean, besides, um, besides uh, the Eurozone. Well, defense, because, you know, basically defense is where France has the upper end over Germany, you know, exactly the reverse of the economy. And, and Germany trusts France as a military leader. And with Britain gone, you know, France is the only uh, serious military uh, power in Europe. So I think that France, you know, will, will try to get Germany to be more engaged internationally with its military uh, and, or, and to finance more of, it, of, of, of many operations. But, but France will have some influence over, over Germany. Uh, on trade, uh, Germany has shifted its position uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, to, now uh, Germany is for reviewing like Chinese, Chinese investments in strategic industries. Uh, before that, you know, it was much more free trader. Um, and uh, Germany even supports, you know, the Buy European Act, which would be the counterpart of the Buy American Act in public procurement. Of course, you know, many countries in Northern Europe who are free traders, they, they don't want that. But again, you know, there probably will be some compromises. Now, on taxes, Macron wants to ar harmonize corporate taxes. But Macron wants to tax the GAFA more because they don't pay taxes in Europe. Uh, all of their profits, you know, resurface in Ireland, and then those profits are for the IRS to, to tax, not for Europe or Ireland. Uh, so they, the idea is to tax them on their turnover not their, their profits. And then there is an issue which is called the posted workers, which is, you know, that mo workers mostly from Eastern Europe, they can work in Western Europe at higher wages, but, but the employers would not have to pay the higher payroll taxes of Western Europe. So this gives a big advantage to, to these workers, and of course, the host country consider that it's social dumping. You know, it's keeping their uh, they are workers unemployed uh, or at, uh, having lower wages. But for Eastern Europe, it's like a fundamental right in the EU, the mobility of, of you know, free freedom of movement, including to work anywhere you want. So, so that is a big uh, controversy, especially between Macron and the Polish prime minister, you know, very conservative, and, and they are, you know, on the brink of a diplomatic crisis. Um, okay, so, so you can imagine, so behind all of this, 
there is a philosophy that Macron and Merkel share, which is to reform Europe. It's that called uh, multi-speed Europe. And multi-speed Europe means that you know, some countries want to integrate more, you know, France, Germany, but Italy, Spain, many others, you know, uh, should not be held back by Eastern European uh, countries. Um, and, uh, but of course, the East Europeans, they don't want to become second class citizen, just, be, just because they don't, or most of them, with a few exceptions, don't belong to the Eurozone, and the Eurozone is the core of the you know, fast speed Europe, if you want. Um, so, so here you see, you know, ma again, a ma major tension. Um, and there are two uh, examples that show you that there is a cultural war, you know, like in the United States maybe, that is developing between East and, and Western Europe. Um, one is about the refugee crisis, uh, which 11 countries in Eastern Europe mostly refused, and, and also Denmark and Sweden, <laughs> but refused uh, to take in any refugee, even though the EU, where they belong, of course, and they voted, uh, agreed to a quota system, but they refused to implement those quotas. And they said, they said that you know, it's, it's too much encro encroachment on their national sovereignty. Uh, and of the other Europeans say, well, this is no solidarity. We are giving you actually the biggest transfers of funds, you know, go to, to Poland. And so we, are, we have solidarity for you, but it's not reciprocal. The other issue is, is about democracy and the rule of law in Poland and, and Hungary, uh, where, uh, you know, the, the Polish authorities are, are changing the recruitment of, the, of their Supreme Court and also uh, new rules about the press uh, and the freedom of the press. In, in Hungary, you've heard probably about you know, the Soros University, which is also restricted in its you know, freedom of, 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 uh, of thinking, of thought. So, so this is maybe you know, something that if Europe even can relaunch you know, under Franco-German uh, leadership, uh, it has a cost. It has, uh, the cost is that what, what happens of the, of, the, of, of the Europe which is not in the Eurozone? And, and so, see, you solve some problems, but you can create some more problems. Okay, I'm going to, to stop here because I've been too long already, but, uh, but I'm curious to, to hear about your questions. Thank you very much. We will now have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and Wesley and I will come and hand you the microphone. Ah. Hi, um, so you mentioned some ways in which uh, Europe could be reunified, like if the ties between France and Germany got stronger. What do you think would have to happen for um, unity in Europe to become weaker and to get worse? Like what, would, what do you think would be a catalyst for that to happen? For Europe to become weaker, I think what would have to happen is that nothing is done. Because the trend is for Europe to be more fragmented politically uh, between East and West, North and South, and, uh, and therefore, and all of the crises I described to you at the beginning, you know, not being solved uh, by uh, innovating with uh, new policies. So I think that, uh, that that is the the risk. The risk is to do nothing or to do, of course, uh, you know, the wrong things, but that we don't know yet. Uh, we don't know if they are the right things or the wrong things, and we don't know whether the, you know, these new initiatives will work, how far they will go, uh, and what kind of obstacles they will run into. But at least uh, the Europeans are, you know, like they do, you know, once every other decade, 
uh, also. You know, they see that crises are accumulating and they are against the war. And, uh, and then there is a window of opportunity. Uh, you know, and that means that among, you know, the, the, the politics across the various countries is right, you know, for, to move ahead. It was the case, you know, for, for Maastricht. Maastricht was just after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And already at the time, the Europeans feared that uh, the, uh, the US would weaken uh, its, uh, its protection for, uh, of Europe. And so they took, they started, you know, these defense policies, which never amounted to very much, but uh, they, they still uh, tried to move ahead on defense and mostly, of course, at the time, on the euro. Um, so, so maybe we are at this kind of moment when Europe, you know, all of a sudden thinks that we need to do something and maybe we can do something and, and we want to do it. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, one recent uh, theory that has, that has been put forward a lot is this idea of a multi-speed Europe, in which we see certain nations, uh, France, perhaps Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, et cetera, moving forward with tighter integration, whereas those on, on the periphery perhaps can refrain from further integrating into Europe. Okay. I want to ask for yours. Okay, can you repeat the, the yeah, last just phrase, please? Uh, on multi-speed Europe, right, yes. in which we have sort of a core that is integrating further, and the periphery yes. holding back from further integration. I wanted to ask sort of your thoughts on how, how this, like, what impa implications this might have for the broader European project, um, and whether, whether or not you think this is feasible or likely in the future. Uh, well, this would be, of course, extremely serious <clears throat> if Europe was paralyzed in its decision making uh, because you'd have one set of countries who wants to move ahead but cannot get their laws passed. You, you know that they, there are many, still a number of, uh, of policy areas where uh, there is unanimity required in, 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 in voting in the uh, Council of Ministers or the, or the Parliament. And, uh, the Council of Ministers, certainly. And, uh, and among those policy areas, you have defense, uh, you have taxes, so imagine that all, you know, that European, Europe would be paralyzed uh, on so many of the issues that where there are some problems today and, and so prevent it from solving those problems. Uh, so I don't imagine that there would be, a, of course, a split like, like, the, like Eastern Europe uh, decided to leave the European Union. I don't think that's in the cards because they benefit so much from the European Union, uh, economically and, and otherwise. Um, so uh, I don't think that would happen, but uh, it would just uh, slow down you know, Europe and, and, and undermine this movement, which, is, which seems to be on the way to, to reform Europe, to make it you know, more capable of dealing with this crisis. Hmm? Hi, um, thank you very much for your speech. I actually come from Budapest, Hungary, uh, and like many of the countries that you mentioned, uh, my country has a resurgent far-right party, and as a result, uh, our government has begun to embrace many illiberal policies. Uh, you mentioned the pressure that was placed on the CEU, Central European Soros University, this summer. Also, it has rejected any of the refugee agreements that the, uh, the EU has proposed. Um, what should the EU as an institution do when its own member states begin to violate its, po its values and its principles? Okay, well, that's a, that's a very good question, as your, your English is perfect. Uh, I'm very impressed. Um, well, of course, the, uh, the EU has some remedies for that, but they are very difficult uh, to, uh, to decide and to put in place and to implement. So in the cases of, you know, Soros University uh, and uh, what's going on in, uh, in, in Poland as well, 
um, th there is the, an Article 7, you know, that uh, you must be aware of, <coughs> of, the, of, the Euro of the European Union Treaty that allows the EU to, uh, you know, to take away some of the voting rights uh, of, in this case, Hungary or, or Poland. Um, so, so that would be, of course, uh, leading to, to a serious crisis. I mean, imagine, you know, that already, you know, Hungary, Poland, they feel uh, overwhelmed by, you know, the majority of the EU, which does, doesn't agree with them. So I think that it, it would, that you would really heading, be heading for, for a major political crisis. Um, but, uh, but there are legal remedies, uh, if not, you know, uh, read, ready uh, political remedies. Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, let's take the, uh, well, also, you know, for, for, for decisions like this by the EU, you need unanimity. And uh, if uh, Poland and Hungary, you know, each side with the other, uh, they're not going to get unanimity. See unanimity. So, so that's also that's also a problem. But I agree with you that you know there are many issues where compromise can be found. You know, you can disagree. You know, like Northern Europe and Southern Europe to simplify on on economics, the eurozone, and uh, but you can find compromises. But when it comes to the very fundamental values on which the EU was founded and and still wants to live by then it's true that the, the level of, uh, of potential conflict is, is, is raised pretty, pretty high. So, so it remains to be seen how, how far it goes. But I think that, uh, I, I think this is something that uh, we, we, we need to, to keep looking at. Uh, but again, I don't, I don't see uh, Eastern Europe leaving the EU. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, you touched a bit on migration, <clears throat> yeah. but I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how the varying approaches to the integration of migrants between yeah. EU countries might change and then affect um, intra-EU uh, relationships. Okay, um, well, well, there are certainly different, ah, thank you. There are certainly different uh, histories of immigration and integration among the European countries. Thank you, Wesley. He's very good, really. Um, and uh, for example, fr France has, a, has always been an immigration country and has successfully, uh, more or less, but mostly see more, uh, succeeded in integrating immigrants from, from the mid 19th century. Uh, most other European countries were emigration countries. Um, and so, but even the French way of integration, you know, which has long be, been assimilation, really, and, uh, and through laïcité, and, uh, which is French secularism. Uh, so other countries have, have different, of course, different ways to integrate their immigrants including their Muslim immigrants, but none is working well. So, so even countries that have, you know, tried multiculturalism, you know, like to, like Sweden or Britain or, you know, Northern Europe in general, they have not really fully succeeded. So I, I would say that whatever the integration system, even your immigration history is, uh, nothing has worked very well. What's happening is that the European countries have, have had a less and less a will, if you want, to integrate immigrants because, uh, you know, the, the, the dominant doctrines are, you know, those of human rights. And so, you know, even trying to inculcate the, their culture to immigrants is considered to be abusive, you know, to many people. Uh, and they have developed these, you know, cultures of repentance considering that you know all their history is uh, is uh, marred with uh, you know like atrocities or uh, you know 
uh, and, and crimes vis-a-vis uh, -vis minorities. So, so I think that the, the, these European countries has less, have less and less the will to, to integrate. And then on the other side, <clears throat> many uh, immigrants, Muslim immigrants, have also less uh, the desire to integrate. And they can be uh, immigrants, but they can be also, you know, like uh, folks who have been in Europe for several generations. Um, so they're no longer immigrants, of course, they are citizens. But, uh, you know, the fact that uh, uh, is Islam as a religion has radicalized, you know, in the whole world, uh, and that uh, these kind of, uh, of uh, and that has had a very strong echo, of course, uh, within Europe. Um, that, has, uh, that has made it, uh, that has, you know, that has given many immigrants, you know, the, the desire to, to create a more separate society from the mainstream society. So, of course, many integrate very well, but, but many others, and, 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 more and more so, unfortunately, you know, they, you know, if, especially if they respect, you know, the most radical version of Islam, they will see, they will see that they should not, that it would be actually, uh, you know, not, not proper according to Islam to try to integrate in a non-Islamist culture. So you see, it, it's, it's very complicated, but I don't think that the uh, independent variable is, is the, the mode of integration of each and every European countries because they all have different ones. Now, the U.S. is totally different because the immigration in the U.S., especially uh, for uh, Muslims, is very different. There are way, way fewer Muslims. They, they are uh, much better off, better educated, and, um, and so, of course, the U.S. doesn't have uh, the kind of, of, you know, doesn't face the kind of problems that Europe is facing. Yeah. Is that, is that an answer to your question? Huh? Yeah? Please join me one more time in thanking our speaker. Thank you all very, very much. Have a good evening.